we are going to dig into the legal implications here. Uh, we are turning to a CBS News legal contributor, Jessica Levinson, for more analysis. Jessica, you are also a professor at Loyola Law School. It's really good to see you. Um, first off, um, just assessing the uh, draft opinion that we saw, does this appear to be authentic? And what are the consequences, uh, you know, when we consider the fact that, you know, this could be a document that was leaked from the Supreme Court? Uh, the consequences, it's absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. So the judicial branch is always the one that operates in the least amount of transparency. It's the darkest. It, one of their norms is secrecy. To have a leak of a draft opinion is absolutely unprecedented. But if we think about it, if there was going to be a moment where we were going to break down those Supreme Court norms, where the walls were going to fall, and there would be light that was shined on what happens in the Supreme Court, I think it was going to be this opinion. Mm -hmm. So does, you asked me, does it look authentic? Yes, it does. And we'll note that the Supreme Court has not issued any sort of statement saying we deny the authenticity of this draft opinion. So who could have leaked it? I think we actually have a very small group of potential suspects here. I think it's one of the nine justices or one of the 36 law clerks. Every justice gets four law clerks who would have their hands on this draft opinion and be able to Xerox it and provide it to a member of the press. You know, in terms of just what a shell shock it was, mm -hmm. yes, the opinion itself is huge. It was expected, but it's still stunning to see. But the fact that it came in a draft form as a, apparently an unauthorized leak, it's really hard to overstate how much I think that will be an absolute earthquake for the Supreme Court going forward. Mm. Yeah, um, and, and Jessica, I, I like how you, because we absolutely do not know who potentially leaked this, uh, that you uh, essentially point out that it could be any of the justices. I know that there are some people who are suggesting it. It's perhaps somebody who works for one of the liberal justices, but you never know. It could be a clerk, rather. Yeah. Uh, it could be one of the conservative justices as a trial balloon. We absolutely have no idea. Um, so, so, you know, in other words, to see what the, what the, the, the temperature is like out mm -hmm. there, um, although all the justices always say that they make their decisions not based on what people or the media or politicians think about their decisions. But, you know, um, that point that you just made is increasingly sort of being questioned. Right. And I think, you know, when Jessica says this is like an earthquake, that's the core issue. Right. Will, will people be able to trust the Supreme Court? Right. Right. If this is some sort of strategy, deliberately, like you said, if it is just to sort of float it out there to see what the reaction is like, or if it's to pressure people to go to the polls, none of it is good for the opinion of the Supreme Court, yeah. the opinion people have of the right, Supreme Court. Right, because Jessica, Marie raises an excellent point, which is that in the last couple of years, people have come to see, rightly or wrongly, uh, increasingly, they've come to see this body as a political body. Yeah. And so when you look at some of the justices who were uh, nominated by presidents who did not win the popular vote, for example, if you look for, if you look at some of the justices uh, who many people feel were uh, nominated illegitimately, in other words, uh, because they were rushed through the process, um, and that is certainly the concern of some of the uh, people in this country, um, what does something like this do for people who are on the fence as to whether or not they believe that these justices are impartial? I think it makes them look like any other political body. I think that's why we can essentially eliminate Chief Justice John Roberts, who does not want to be the Chief Justice presiding over the court that moves from looking like a genuine federal judicial body that basically goes behind a curtain, divines the meaning of the law, and then comes out with a written opinion, almost as if it comes down from a mountain and says, we figured out what it means. Here it is public. He doesn't want to go from the chief justice presiding over that to be the chief justice that presides over the Supreme Court where the wheels come off. Mm. And we wonder how long that car can drive without wheels, where we look at them and we say, they look like Congress. They look like mm. a leaky ship where they're trying to play each other, where they're talking to the press. And so what does this mean for the Supreme Court? I mean, let's remember our grand experiment in three branches of government is dependent on a functioning judiciary. And the Supreme Court stands on top of that. And let's remember, they don't have a police force. They don't have an army. They have the power of the pen. 
And so it's actually incredibly serious to the extent that we stop respecting them and their decisions. That's a fundamental crumbling of what we understand our structure of government to be. Mm. One thing I wanted to mention in terms of all of this kind of who would leak it, who would benefit, you know, with the benefit of thinking about this for 12 hours or so now, I think it's a member of the majority. I think it's a member of the majority or one of their clerks who says, I'm going to try to exert that political pressure that you two were just talking about, where if you change your opinion, if you try and join Chief Justice John Roberts or the liberals, you'll look like you were just bowing to political pressure. Mm. You'll look weak. I also think we're talking about this now. This is further from the midterm elections. And this does energize, as Caitlin said, it does energize Democrats. And so the more we can have a trial balloon, get accustomed to this being the new law of the land, I think the better that is for Republicans. I want to talk to you a little bit about the actual law, the, the two sort of big cases. Roe v. Wade is one of them. That's what we keep hearing about. But there's also a Griswold versus uh, Connecticut. And what the access to abortion is connected to, because it's not as di as clear. There's no obviously right to abortion in the Constitution. There's also no right to privacy in the Constitution. But that's what's sort of underpinning this. Can you, in like the most layman of layman terms, explain you know explain the law that has been sort of reinforcing access to abortion for the last you know several decades, and and why you know some see it as not the strongest. Um, uh, the strongest positioning for this case. Absolutely. My constitutional law students are going to cry because I'll do hopefully in 30 seconds what <laughs> it takes us a few weeks to do, which is there's the 14th Amendment. There's a due process clause. It protects our liberty interests. We have decided that under that liberty interest, there's something called the right to privacy. Is it written anywhere in the Constitution? No, it's not. We've interpreted that as part of the meaning of the word liberty. We do that all the time with respect to the Constitution, which is filled with really broad words that are frankly there to interpret. Mm. And so part of what we did in that right to privacy is we say, what comes in that bowl? What, what fills up that bucket? One of the things is the right to obtain contraception. That's the Griswold case, Anne-Marie, that you were just talking about, where the Supreme Court said, states, you can't prohibit First, it was married couples, and then it was unmarried couples from obtaining contraception. Then we built on that, and we said there's a right to obtain an abortion. That was Roe. That was Casey. We've also used that to protect the right to marry, whether or not you're a member of a heterosexual couple or a homosexual couple. And so when we see an opinion like this, where at times Justice Alito, who drafted the opinion, looks like he's saying, no, there's something different about abortion. We have to be really careful about that because as your question lays out so well, this is part of the foundation of our understanding of a whole line of cases that protect many rights that we're accustomed to. Imagine a world in which states just start banning the ability to obtain contraception. That's a world that's unimaginable to us, but that's what it means if we really say the right to privacy, because it's not written in the Constitution, it's not protected. Uh, this such an excellent discussion, Jessica. R really quickly, in 15 seconds, is it illegal to leak that draft document? Because, you know, you have a lot of people talking about this and some people saying folks should be prosecuted under yeah. what law? I, I actually don't think it's illegal. I've seen a little bit of that chatter, you know, as I've kind of not slept through the last night thinking about this. Um, it depends who, how. But no, I don't think that there would be a violation of a criminal statute here. Things could change depending on the situation, but I don't think so at this point. All right, Jessica Levinson, always great to have your analysis and clarity. Uh, Jessica, thank you very much. Thank you.